Hi, I'm Heidi from Garden Crossings and today I am going to be taking you for a walk through my home garden. A few of the things that are looking especially nice right now are the clematis along with the smooth hydrangeas. So I thought we're supposed to be getting some rain tomorrow so I wanted to get out today and get this done before the rain kind of just puts that rainy look on the plants. So let's go ahead and take a walk through the garden. Um, before we start though, I will say we are a zone 5B, 6A in West Michigan. So all of the plants that you're seeing in this tour can be grown in a zone 5B. If there's anything that you're liking in this tour, you can head to our website, gardencrossings.com, for more information on those plants. Let's go ahead and get walking through the garden. We're actually gonna start at the roadside at our mailbox, and I wanted to show you this Silmakivi clematis. This has been on this mailbox for, I don't even know how many years, 15 or so year now, years now, and it is doing fabulous. This is one plant and it is totally covering up the mailbox. It's in its prime right now. It's just loaded with flowers and there's a lot of buds yet too. So, I mean, there's gonna be a lot more blooms coming, um, but this is a really pretty kind of a icy bluish purple clematis, nice big flowers and really has done fabulous here on this mailbox for years. Um, if you're looking for something to put on your mailbox, clematis is a great thing. A lot of the neighbors in the neighborhood here have various different clematis on their mailbox. Um, so if you're just looking to kind of cover up the ugly wood pole, clematis are a great option. Plants at the front of the house are doing really well. You can see those Super Tunia Vista jazzberries are filling out nicely. They, by the end of the summer, will create a massive show of color along that sidewalk. Um, also, some of the new varieties for 2024, I'm not going to specifically mention those because I have them in other videos, um, but they too, they are performing fabulously, filling out really nice here in these aqua pots. We're going to make our way around the side of the house and see a little bit of hydrangea color. As we're making our way around the house, the first hydrangea we're going to stop at, although it's not blooming quite yet, is the quick fire hydrangea. This is a hardy hydrangea that is just loaded with buds. So this will be flowering probably in the next maybe two weeks or so. So we're excited to wait as that opens up. The bobo hydrangea along the walk here, they too are just starting to form buds. Typically those won't bloom for, oh man, probably beginning to mid August or so. But you're starting to see some color and these are the invincible hydrangeas. So we'll stop in here first to show you the little guys. We have invincible ruby, beautiful, bright, kind of, I'm going to say cherry pink, not red, but really bright pink blooms. They're very compact, only about two to three foot tall or so. This is a reliable hydrangea that blooms off of the new growth. It's part of the Invincible series, which is the reblooming series of the smooth hydrangeas. The next one we're seeing, which is quite a bit bigger, is the Incredible Blush, which is a lighter pink color. And these flowers are just starting to open up as well. So as the flowers are fully open, you'll see that kind of coloration. And as they're starting to open, it's a little bit more of that dusty pink color. Um, so like I said, this one is just starting to open and this plant is about four foot tall by almost six foot wide. So it's really a very large plant and part of the incredible family, which they're not reblooming hydrangeas, but really beautiful here. Making our way through, let's see what else we have to show you. I mentioned at the beginning that there's a lot of hydrangeas and clematis blooming right now. Here we have the Venosa Valacia clematis really pretty purple with kind of a white starry center to it. It's doing really nice. And I have this mixed on this trellis with the Jolly Good Clematis, which is a much smaller flower form, a little bit more rosy undertones there in the purple, um, but you can kind of see the little bit difference in the flower size. Whenever I plant a Clematis on a structure, I always mix two of them together because that way if one's not blooming, hopefully the other one is to kind of extend the color on that space. Now it just so happens that these here are both blooming at the same time, which is fine. They look great kind of mixed together there. This little area is uh, north facing. 
so it gets a little bit more shade. Right now it's late afternoon, uh, so that's why the sun is kind of not on this garden. But a lot of the colors you're seeing right now in this space would be the Dianthus Paint the Town. And these are still doing really good. You can see there's a lot of dead buds there because the plant is really past its prime, but all that little color you're seeing now are all secondary blooms. So we'll go through, give it a light trim, and we'll be getting about this much show of color throughout the summer, which is great. The white you're seeing there is a Campanula White Clips, another just nice low growing um, perennial. So something if you're looking to create a border, those are a great border plant because they don't get super tall. Alstroemeria Inca Ice is starting to flower and is doing gorgeous. This is about three foot tall. We're going to be seeing other Alstom areas on the garden tour. And those are only about a foot tall. Um, the ones we'll be showing here in a little bit are going to be more your southern Alstom area. Hardy in zone 7 and 8. Where, like I said, we're zone 5. And this one comes back regularly. Um, and I'm not sure what the difference is. Why those more southern varieties with that you know upper hardiness zone only get about a foot tall and this one gets three foot tall they're all in the same series so you'd think they'd have similar heights so i'm not really sure what the reasoning is um, but no matter what this being taller those being shorter they bloom all summer long so if you can get a plant that blooms all summer long that is a huge win some of the other things that are nestled in here, these bleeding heart have been blooming all spring and they're still blooming. Just that little bit of white there, those fern leaf bleeding heart. Chartreuse foliage is the Wajilla snippet lime. A little heuchera tucked in there blooming. It's kind of a jam-packed full mature garden at this point, which is nice because this also kind of helps keep the weeds at bay. So that's a good thing. This little garden bed here is under the deck, so it gets a lot of shade, a lot of hosta in here, just to kind of fill the space. Um, also, here we have a little astilbe trying to bloom. It's, it's trying to fight its way through those rebecca, but that looks really pretty, just that little splash of pink. The hosta in this garden that really always gets the attention is this one front and center here. This is Hosta Liberty. Excellent flower, or <laughs> excellent foliage color. And that white, look at that. I mean, it just pops against all those greens and blues that are mixed with it here in this garden bed. There's another astilbe there blooming really nicely. Just to kind of break up that hosta texture and color a little bit. Up against the window, we have the invincible limettas. So I wasn't sure earlier. I'm like, I keep forgetting what they were because they weren't flowering yet. But now that these are flowering, this is the Limetta hydrangea. And these actually are quite a bit taller than what they should be. Uh, these ones here normally only get about three foot tall. And I would say these are probably more like three and a half to even maybe four foot tall. This is a planting of three hydrangeas there in front of that window. And the idea was for them to be below the window in height, but you can see that they're, they're getting just a little bit taller than the window. In this space, we tucked a lot of the sun patients in. That's the white you're seeing. Also, there's some Nepeta down there, the purple, and then a few of the pink diamond bleeding hearts, which bloom all summer long as well. Rod recently came through and also tucked in a few of the paint the town Dianthus, which is the pink you're seeing. We've really been loving that plant. Uh, we did a mass planting at the greenhouse last year and have been just over the moon thrilled with how it's done. So we've been using it in a lot more places, both here and at the Northern Michigan Garden, just because, I mean, to get that massive color early on and then to have the, the color we're seeing now, that's great. Anytime you can get a plant that will give you kind of two fur, like two shows or three shows throughout the summer is quite a, a, a great thing to have. We're going to walk in here to show you another clematis. Nice, beautiful white one. Unfortunately, this one was planted several years ago. We planted a red, a white, and a blue on this trellis or on this obelisk. And I don't remember what this particular variety is. 
Um, it looks like it could be candida, although the flowers are just a little bit too big to be candida. So I'm, I'm thinking that's probably not what they are. Um, but like I said, I like to plant more than one clematis on a, on a structure. That way, if one's not blooming, maybe another one is. We're going to work our way into this garden space here, too. And again, this one is just packed full of plants. So I'm going to try to make my way through without stepping on something. There's some more clematis blooming in here. There's another of the Venosa Vilatia blooming. And you can see there's a lot of foliage on this obelisk. And that's all from a second clematis that will be blooming later on. So once the purple ones are fading, which we're kind of seeing is happening now, this is going to have another show of color here shortly. Making our way through to show you a few more of the clematis. And I'm hoping a little critter doesn't come out in this garden as I'm stepping between these plants and not seeing what's hiding under them. Here we have the Jack Manny clematis, which is kind of one of those tried and true favorites. Many people are familiar with Jack Manny. This one is probably about six foot tall on this obelisk, but it could get much taller if I had a taller um, structure for it to climb. Beautiful, deep, dark purple blooms. And the blooms are just loaded from top to bottom. So with this particular clematis, this one I have just one planted because this one is so aggressive that there's really not a lot of room to have an additional one tucked in on this structure. More beautiful clematis. And these are, man, these are as old as the garden is and have done fabulous. This here is the blue light clematis. Right now the sun is shining on it, so they look like they're white, but actually they're a very soft kind of a crystal or a very pale blue flower. And it, it's just, it's beautiful. I love the kind of ruffly edges on it. And I have this one mixed with this beautiful purple one down here. And they just do fabulous. I'll try to get you another angle so you can see the color better. So there's the beautiful dark purple. And then maybe if we get down here a little bit in the shade, you can see a little bit there that hue of that light ice blue. Rod and I were talking the other night and he's like, you know what, we should really just tear those off and put some new clematis since these are so old. And I'm like, you know what, the first time you do that, they're not going to come back near as gorgeous as what this one is here. So I'm like, let's just leave them. Don't break a good thing because especially with plants, you know, if you have them and they're looking good and you try something new, usually that can be a recipe for disaster. This bed here too, Rod's got it all lined with those paint the town fuchsia dianthus. And then he did a uh, kind of a mass planting here of the violet perfusion salvia as well. One thing that we had noticed when we were out walking last night is that a lot of the late spring blooming perennials are kind of blooming a little later and some of the summer bloomers are blooming earlier. So we had talked and we're like, I don't remember daylilies blooming at the same time as this Amsonia was. And I had talked to some people today out in the gardens at the garden center and they too had kind of noticed that plants seem to be blooming on a different schedule this year. All right, let's head on over to the circle garden and see what we've got going over here. So this garden has, well, let's see, four different varieties of plants maybe five. Um, we've got the limelight hydrangea in the center, and that's the tall kind of focal point of this garden. We have the dwarf bloomering lilacs, which are the early season color. We've got the beautiful foliage of the Maimone wajila. We have the peachy roses here of the at last rose. And then we tucked in some annuals because we want constant color always going on. And with that, we did the red sun patients. So this garden is always just a, a beautiful mix of color. I love how the red sun patients really kind of pull out the pink in the My Monet Wajila. That looks really nice together. And then although it seems like an odd combination, but the red and the, the peach from the roses look stunning together as well. These are so fragrant, those Atlas roses. They're just gorgeous. All right, let's take a look and see what we've got blooming out here in the butterfly garden. 
So the butterfly garden is doing really well. This patch here of cone flowers right in front of me, full of buds, so those will be blooming shortly. This whole garden here is lined with the sun patients, the white sun patients. And I do that because that way it kind of frames it in and gives a beautiful effect at night. It really makes the garden just kind of glow in the dark. It's a bobo hydrangea waiting to do its thing later in the summer. Here we've got the Miss Molly butterfly bush. It's full of buds, so that will be exciting to watch. It's going to be a magenta bloomer once it starts. Got some Monarda blooming. This is a uh, part of the Pardon My series of Monarda or Bee Balm. Beautiful purple blooms. And you can see it's got a fairly tidy habit there. It's been planted for a few years and really hasn't done a ton of spreading. The Spagila, oh, those plants. Little Redhead, absolutely gorgeous. One of the most vibrant, beautiful reds, I think, in the garden. It's paired with a pink profusion salvia, which is almost done flowering. Kind of walk in the garden path and see what we have going in here. So more clematis. So this is the Viva Polonia, which is one of the proven winners clematis. And it is doing so pretty. Look at those beautiful magenta blooms with kind of that white star in the center. This one is about four foot tall on the uh, structure that I have it on. And just loaded with beautiful magenta blooms. I have this one paired with a diamond ball clematis, which hasn't started to bloom yet. So that will be a pretty white once it starts to flower. The white wands Veronica, just starting to bloom. Behind it, you'll see another spagilla. Gorgeous. That's a beautiful native variety. Got some of the opening act phlox blooming. Quite a very um, bold presence of color. Ooh, we've even got some butterfly, some Escalapius. This is the Cinderella Escalapius. This stuff kind of spreads and goes a little wild in the garden, but I'm okay with that because this is the host plant for the monarch um, butterflies. This is where they lay their eggs. This is the food the caterpillars will eat. So it's really important that if you're looking to attract the monarch butterflies to your garden, that you do have milkweed in your garden. Planted up front here, we have some Nepeta. This is the cat's meow, and the pollinators are just going crazy on that right now. I'm kind of hoping it's kind of spreading and taking over this space. I have a few lilies tucked in there, and I'm hoping because the Nepeta's in there, maybe that'll keep the rabbits away, because I've never seen those lilies bloom, because the rabbits always get to them first. Lupin are kind of at the end of their of their cycle, but man, beautiful. I love the structure that Lupin give to the garden. My Delphinium just opened. Wow, I haven't seen this blooming yet. This is the blue light, I believe it is Delphinium. It's gorgeous. These are over six foot tall. So it's real important when you plant Delphinium that you give them some sort of structure to kind of hold them from tipping over in this situation. We'll take a peek in here. I have a tomato cage, it's yellow, that we're growing them in. And that just kind of keeps, uh, keeps them sturdy so they don't flop over in the wind. Another beautiful loop in there. Some more phlox, kind of a little patches of phlox kind of tucked in there. Here's our firelight hydrangea. This one will be blooming later on in the season, but with gorgeous white blooms that turn red as they transition. All right, let's head on over to the corner here and check out the beautiful Hosta garden. So I don't have a lot of shade, as I've said before, so you really have to utilize your shade well when you just have little spaces of it. So when we plant this hosta garden up, we really try not to double up on any hostas. So this is quite a collection of hostas, taking a lot of different colors, textures, sizes, leaf shapes, all the things. 
mixing them all in, planting them all together, just to create a patchwork of color here in this back corner. Uh, I know oftentimes a lot of people get excited about this little area because I think it is kind of just different and unique with seeing all the different colors and textures of the hostas all planted together. In this area, we also took a few coleus and popped them in. That's the dark foliage you're seeing there just to kind of break up the greens a little bit. Also kind of in the back there, you'll see some dark spots and that's also the coleus torch light. This bright splash of yellow here, this is the Aurelia Sun King. And that's another great shade plant if you're looking to add just a splash of some different color and texture into the shade garden. Aurelia Sun King is a gorgeous chartreuse looking uh, perennial that gets about three foot tall and three foot wide. As we transition into the sun, you'll see there are still some hostas that can handle more sun. Typically they're gonna be more the yellows and the greens, not so much with the white. Although you'll see there are some white ones and they're holding up pretty good. Here we've got a, a fern. That's a great plant for that part shade, shady area. There's a few astilbes tucked here and there. Some corabels. Although this area doesn't do great with corabels and I think it's because we water it every day. So I think the, the soil maybe stays too moist for the corabels. So there used to be a lot, but then once we put our underground sprinkling in, they just, they haven't loved this area so well. Another hydrangea kind of up there by the tree, not blooming yet, but it's full of buds. Some of that chartreuse you're seeing is bleeding heart. That was a spring bloomer, so it's just kind of the foliage that's left over. A pink alstroemeria there. That one has been in here for probably 15 to 18 years and just continues to do fabulous. Um, you can see the silvery heart-shaped leaves of the Bernera. Another giant astilbe that will be white when it starts blooming. I like to use a lot of white in the garden along with chartreuse. I've said this before because I love how those colors just really pop in the night. Another Atlas Rose. There's some corbels that are doing fairly well. Tropical Rose Sun Patient. A Minarda or Bee Balm. This one is Let's see, what is it? Upscale Lavender Taffeta. So this is actually a new one for 2023. Beautiful lavender color. Another Clematis here on a trellis, just starting to open. This is jolly good as well. And these flowers will totally fill, let me get out of the sun here a little bit. These flowers will totally fill this once it starts to open. But a little bit more smaller flower form but really a beautiful one. Some Coreopsis up there, the yellow flowers you're seeing. There's also some more hydrangeas up on this hill. They're not quite open yet. A stilby. Let's see. There we've got a Spirea. Looks like double play gold. I love astilbe. I just think they're such a fun little plant. Purple you're seeing there is geranium roseanne. Here's our daylily patch. Not blooming yet. Well, I guess there's two blooms. Not a lot of blooms yet, but this will be a whole multitude of different colors once these daylilies all start to bloom. Got another clematis up here by the shed. Let's take a look at that one. So this is the Stand By Me clematis we're going to go look at. Stand By Me is a non-clinging clematis, which means it doesn't wrap around the structure. So the structure is used basically to hold it up. So again, this would be something you could use like a tomato cage if you wanted to, to just kind of hold it. Um, but beautiful little nodding lavender blue flowers. In the back, I'm gonna see if I can zoom in. 
Calicanthus aphrodite. I don't know if you can see it back there, but beautiful red flowers, super fragrant. That shrub's probably 10 to 12 foot tall, and it is doing such a fabulous job this year of flowering. I've never seen it with so many flowers. Really stunning. More of the opening act blush flocks, really filling out this space nicely. Some hibiscus back there, the nice dark near black foliage you're seeing. The incredible hydrangea is just about ready to open. The buds are nice and full. They're still fairly lime green colored, but give them another week and they'll be big, huge white flowers. The incredible hydrangea, many of you are familiar with Annabelle. And with Annabelle, a lot of times that one can get floppy when it rains or even when it doesn't. It's just not very sturdy. Incredible is, has very sturdy stems, really huge flowers, and doesn't flop. So it's a great replacement for Annabelle, just with a better habit and better structure and really huge, huge flowers. Invincible Spirit is blooming. This was actually the first pink in the, our uh, smooth hydrangea family, our arborescent family. You can just see all the buds. Gorgeous plant. Tucked behind it, we have some more clematis, so we're going to work our way in there. Um, but as we work our way in, here's another uh, sample of the Viva Polonia, the proven winners clematis. Doing really nice. Structured back in here, we've got Raguchi and Princess Diana. So Raguchi are these beautiful bell-shaped clematis flowers. Raguchi blooms pretty much a very good portion of the summer. So one of the longest blooming clematis is that we have. Princess Diana is the pink one you're seeing here. Kind of again, another unique flower form, not your typical big open circle of flowers, but Really looks pretty, especially planted on here with the Raguchi. Continuing down the edge of the garden, another hibiscus with that nice dark near black foliage. At last rose. Supertunia persimmon. This is a new supertunia for 2023. And it's got really quite a very lovely color to it. Behind it is another clematis wall. We'll go in and take a closer look. So again, this wall is filled with that purple Raguchi, along with a bunch of those pink Princess Dianas. We've got Candida, which is the white. And you can see Candida really is very prolific here on this structure. And then we also have, looks like some Jolly Good as well, kind of tucked in. So at one time I had 10 different varieties on this fence, but clearly the most prolific four have won the game. The other thing I want to show you is the Ulstrom areas I was talking about earlier. So these are all zone eight, seven or eight Ulstrom areas, which we clearly are not here in West Michigan. But look at, they have come back fabulous. Nice thick foliage, the flowers, you can see the various flowers on these plants. The yellows by far seem to be the most flowerful at this point and also the biggest clumps. But I was just shocked in general to see any of these come back, let alone so many of them. So that was, that was a fun garden surprise. Somebody had wanted to see my reminiscent crema rose. Here it is, and it ain't looking good. So it's because we haven't, we, I think it's too dry. So it's looking kind of dirty and gross. Um, the fresh flowers, when they come out, look really nice. But as the flowers fade, they're just kind of, kind of gross looking. Beautiful sedum here. I think this is the yellow brick road. The variegated foliage you're seeing back in the back there, that's a Heliopsis bit of honey. Not flowering quite yet. Again, I told you Rod went crazy with those Paint the Town magentas. Here's a few more he's planted. And a few more. 
That's paint the town fancy. Oh, I said it was bright ideas. This is actually the, or what did I say? Yellow brick road. This is actually the bright idea. Sedum. I also did kind of a little mass planting in here of lavender. So these are just planted. We'll see how they do. Nepada cat's pajamas. The limelight hydrangea is doing good. Coming back well after its major trim that I gave it this past fall. So that will be fun to watch as it blooms because those blooms are going to be huge. Tucked in the back there is a Lacanthemum marshmallow. Look at that unique thick flowers. Really pretty. Shasta daisies. More lavender. Paint the town uh, pink dot. Some luminary, I think that's coral sunset in the back there, flocks. Penstemon, it's doing nice. Nice dark foliage, white flowers. I believe this one is the onyx and pearls variety. Incredible. So interestingly enough, this incredible is far more advanced than the one at the back of the garden. So I don't know if it's getting more sun or who knows. Gardens can be very interesting sometimes with what they do. Um, but look at how nice and sturdy this plant is. Strong stems held up tall and huge, beautiful white flowers. Thank you for walking through the garden with me tonight. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below. If you're new to our station, we invite you to subscribe. And yeah, hopefully maybe you learned something new about some of the hydrangeas or even certainly the clematis. I don't do a lot of talking about the clematis. So maybe there's some new varieties that maybe would intrigue you for your garden. Thanks for watching today. I'm Heidi from Garden Crossings.